A Legion by Veronica Roth, Chapter 17. Triss. I wake just before the sun. No one else stirs in their cot. Tobias's arm is draped over his eyes, but his shoes are now on, like he got up and walked around in the middle of the night. Christina's head is buried beneath her pillow. I lay for a few minutes, finding patterns in the ceiling, then put on my shoes and run my fingers through my hair to flatten it. The hallways in the compound are empty, except for a few stragglers. I assume they are just finishing the night shift, because they are hunched over screens, their chains propped on their hands, or slumped against broomsticks, barely remembering to sweep. I put my hands in my pockets and follow the signs to the entrance. I want to get a better look at the sculpture I saw yesterday. Whoever built this place must have loved light. There's glass in the curve of each hallway's ceiling and along each lower wall. Even now, when it is barely morning, there's plenty of light to see by. I check my back pocket for the badge Zoe handed to me at dinner last night and pass the security checkpoint with it in hand. Then I see the sculpture, a few hundred yards away from the doors we entered through yesterday, gloomy and massive and mysterious, like a living entity. It is a huge slab of dark stone, square and rough, like the rocks at the bottom of the chasm. A large crack runs through the middle of it, and there are streaks of lighter rocks near the edges. Suspended above the slab is a glass tank of the same dimensions, full of water. A light placed above the center of the tank shines through the water, refracting as it ripples. I hear a faint noise, a drop of water hitting the stone. It comes from a small tube running through the center of the tank. At first, I think the tank is just leaking, but another drop falls, then a third, and a fourth, at the same interval. A few drops collect and then disappear down a narrow channel in the stone. They must be intentional. Hello, Zoe stands on the other side of the sculpture. I'm sorry, I was about to go to the dormitory for you, then saw you heading this way and wondered if you were lost. No, I'm not lost, I say. This is where I meant to go. Ah, she stands behind, beside me and crosses her arms. She is about as tall as I am, but she stands straighter, so she seems taller. Yes, it's pretty weird, right? As she talks, I watch the freckles on her cheeks, dappled like sunlight through dense leaves. Does it mean something? It's the symbol of the Berugian of genetic welfare, she says. The slab of stone is the problem we're facing. The tank of water is our potential for changing that problem. And the drop of water is what we're actually able to do at any given time. I can't help it. I laugh. Not very encouraging, is it? She smiles. That's one way of looking at it. I prefer to look at it another way, which is that if they are pers- which is that if they are persistent enough, even tiny drops of water over time can change the rock forever, and it will never change back. She points to the center of the slab, where there is a small impression, like a shadow bowl cur- carved into the stone. That, for example, wasn't there when they installed this thing. I nod and watch the next drop fall. Even though I'm wary of the Buryu and everybody in it, I can feel the quiet hope of the sculpture working its way through me. It's a practical symbol, communicating the patient attitude that has allowed the people here to, sit for, to stay for so long, watching and waiting. But I have to ask, wouldn't it be more effective to unleash the whole tank at once? I imagine the wave of water colliding with the rock and spilling over the tile floor, collecting around my shoes, doing a little at once can fix something, eventually, but I feel like when you believe that something is truly a problem, you throw everything you have at it, because you just can't help yourself. Momentarily, she says, but then we wouldn't have any water left to do anything else, and genetic damage isn't the kind of problem that can be solved with one big charge. I understand that, I say. I'm just wondering if it's a good thing to resign yourself quite this much to small steps when you could take some big ones. Like what? I shrug. I guess I don't really know, but it's worth thinking about. Fair enough. So, you said you were looking for me, I say. Why? Oh, Zoe touches her forehead. It slipped my mind. David asked me to find you and to take you to the labs. There's something there that belonged to your mother. My mother? My voice comes out sounding strangled and too high. She leads me away from the sculpture and toward the security checkpoint again. Fair warning, you might get stared at, Zoe says as we walk through the security scanner. There are more people in the hallways up ahead now than there were earlier. It must be time for them to start work. Your face is is a familiar one here. People in the Buryu watch the screens often, and for the past few months, 
you've been involved in a lot of interesting things. A lot of younger people think you're downright heroic. Oh, good, I say, a sour taste in my mouth. Heroism is what I was forced on, not, you know, trying not to die. Zoe stops. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make light of what you've been through. I still feel uncomfortable with the idea that everyone has been watching us, like I need to cover myself or hide where they can't look at me anymore. But there's not much Zoe can do about it, so I don't say anything. Most of the people walking the halls wear variations of the same uniform. It comes in dark blue or dull green, and some of them wear the jackets or jumpsuits or sweatshirts open, revealing t-shirts of a wide variety of colors, some with pictures drawn on them. Do the colors on the uniforms mean anything? I ask Zoe. Yes, actually. Dark blue means scientist or researcher, and green means support staff. They do maintenance, upkeep, and things like that. So they're like the factionless. No, she says. No, the dynamic is different here. Everyone does what they can to support the mission. Everyone is valued and important. She was right. People do stare at me. Most of them just look at me for a little too long. But at some point, and some even say my name like it belongs to them, it makes me feel cramped. I can't move the way I want to. A lot of the support staff used to be in the experiment in Indianapolis, another city not far from here, Zoe says. But for them, this transition has been a little bit easier than it will be for you. Indianapolis didn't have the behavioral components of your city. She pauses. The factions, I mean. After a few generations, when your city doesn't tear itself apart and the others did, the Buryu implanted the faction components in the newer cities, St. Louis, Detroit, and Minneapolis using the relatively new Indianapolis experiment as a, as a control group. The Bergu always placed experiments in the Midwest because there's more space between urban areas here. Out east, everything is closer together. So in, Indianap in Indianapolis, you just corrected their genes and shoved them into a city somewhere without factions? They had a complex system of rules, but yes, that's essentially what happened and it didn't work very well. No, she purses her lips. Genetically damaged people who have been conditioned by suffering and are not taught to live differently, as the factions would have taught them to, are very destructive. The, that experiment failed quickly, within three generations. Chicago, your city, and the other cities that have factions have made it through much more than that. Chicago. It's so strange to have a name for the place that was always just home to me. It makes the city smaller in my mind. So you guys have been doing this for a long time, I say. Quite some time, yes. The Bergu is different from most government agencies because of the focused nature of our work in our contained, relatively remote location. We pass on knowledge and purpose to our children instead of relying on appointments or hiring. I've been training for what I'm doing now for my entire life. Through the abundant windows, I see a strange vehicle. It's shaped like a bird, with two wing structures and a pointed nose, but it has wheels like a car. Is that for air travel? I say, pointing at it. Yes, she smiles. It's an airplane. We might be able to take you up in one sometime, if it doesn't seem too daunting for you. I don't react to the play on words, but I can't, but I can't quite forget how she recognized me on sight. David is standing near one of the doors up ahead. He raises his hand in a wave when he sees us. Hello, Tris, he says. Thank you for bringing her, Zoe. You're welcome, sir, Zoe says. I'll leave you to it, then. Lots of work to do. She smiles at me, then walks away. I don't want her to leave, now that she's gone. I'm left with David and the memory of how I yelled at him yesterday. He doesn't say anything about it, just scans his badge in the door sensor to open it. The room beyond it is an office with no windows. A young man, Mamie Tobias's age, sits at one desk, and another one across the room is empty. The young man looks up when, he, when we come in, taps something on his computer screen, and stands. Hello, sir, he says. Can I help you? Matthew, where's your supervisor? David says. He's forging for food in the cafeteria, Matthew says. Well, maybe you can help me then. I'll need Natalia Wright's file loaded on a portable screen. Can you do that? Right, I think. Was that my mother's real last name? Of course, Matthew says, and he sits again. 
He types something on his computer and pulls up a series of documents that I'm not close enough to see clearly. Okay, it just has to transfer. You must be Natalie's daughter, Beatrice. He props his chin on his hand and looks at me critically. His eyes are so dark they look black, and they slant a little at the edges. He does not look impressed or surprised to see me. You don't look much like her. Triss, I say automatically, but I find it comforting that he doesn't know my nickname. That must mean he doesn't spend t all his time staring at the screens like our lives in the city are entertainment. And, yeah, I know. David pulls a chair over, letting it screech on the tile, and pats it. Sit. I'll give you a screen with all of Natalie's files on it so that you and your brother can read them yourselves. But while they're loading, I might as well tell you the story. I sit on the edge of the chair, and he sits behind the desk of Matthew's supervisor, turning a half-empty coffee cup in circles on the metal. Let me start by saying that your mother was a fantastic discovery. We located her almost by accident inside the damaged world, and her genes were nearly perfect. David beams. We took her out of a bad situation and brought her here. She spent several years here, but then we encountered a crisis within your city's walls, and she volunteered to be placed inside to, re to resolve it. I'm sure you know all about that, though. For a few seconds, all I can do is blink at him. My mother came from outside this place? Where? It hits me again that she walked these halls, watched the city on the screens in the control room. Had she sat in this chair? Had her feet touched these tiles? Suddenly, I feel like there are invisible marks of my mother everywhere, on every wall and doorknob and pillar. I grab the edge of the seat and try to organize my thoughts enough to ask a question. No, I don't know, I say. What crisis? The erudite representative had just begun to kill the divergent, of course, he says. His name was... Nor Norman? Norton, says Matthew, Janine's predecessor. Seems he passed on the idea of killing off the divergent to her right before his heart attack. Thank you. Anyway, we sent Na Natalie in to investigate the situation and to stop the deaths. We never dreamed she would be in there for so long, of course, but she was a useful. We had never thought about having an insider before, and she was able to do many things that were invaluable to us, as well as building a life for herself, which obviously includes you. I frown. But the Divergent were still being killed when I was an initiate. You only know about the ones who died, David says. Not about the ones who didn't die. Some of them are here in this compound. I believe you met Amar earlier. He's one of them. Some of the rescue Divergent needed some distance from your experiment. It was too hard for them to watch the people they had once known and loved going about their lives, so they were trained to integrate into life outside the Buryu. But yes, she did important work, your mother. She also told quite a few lies and very few truths. I wonder if my father knew who she was, where she was really from. He was an abnegation leader, after all, and as such, one of the keepers of the truth. I have a sudden, horrifying thought. What if she only married him because she was supposed to, as part of her mission in the city? What if their entire relationship was a sham? So she wasn't really born dauntless. I say, as I sort through the lies that must have been. When she first entered the city, it was as a dauntless, because she had already had tattoos, and that would have been hard to explain to the natives. She was 16, but we said she was 15, so she would have some time to adjust. Our intention was for her to... He lifts a shoulder. Well, you should read her file. I can't do a 16-year-old perspective justice. As if on cue, Matthew opens a desk drawer and takes out a small, flat piece of glass. He taps it with one finger, and an image appears on it. It's one of the documents he had just had open on his computer. He offers the tablet to me. It's sturdier than I expected it to be, hard and strong. Don't worry, it's practically indestructible, David says. I'm sure you want to return to your friends. Matthew, would you please walk Miss Pryor back to the hotel? I have some things to take care of. And don't I? Matthew says, then winks. Kidding, sir. I'll take her. Thank you, I say to David before he walks out. Of course, he says. Let me know if you have any questions. Ready? Matthew says. He's tall, maybe the same height as Caleb, and his black hair is artfully tasseled in front, like he spent a lot of time making it look just, lo making it look like he just rolled out of bed that way. Under his dark blue uniform, he wears a plain black t-shirt and a black string around his throat. It shifts over his Adam's apple when he swallows. I walk with him out of the small office and down the hallway again. The crowd that was here before has thinned. They must have settled into work or breakfast. 
There are whole lives being lived in this place, sleeping and eating and working, bearing children and raising families and dying. This is a place my mother called home once. I wonder when you're going to freak out, he says, after finding out all this stuff at once. I'm not going to freak out, I say, feeling defensive. I already did, I think, but I'm not going to admit to that. Matthew shrugs. I would, but fair enough. I see a sign that says hotel entrance up ahead. I clutch the screen to my chest, eager to get back to the dormitory and tell Tobias about my mother. Listen, one of the things my, sup my supervisor and I do is genetic testing, Matthew says. I was wondering if you and that other guy, Marcus Eden's son, would mind coming in so that I can test your genes. Why? Curiosity, he shrugs. We haven't gotten to test the genes of someone in such a late generation of the experiment before, and you and Tobias seem to be somewhat odd in your manifestations of certain things. I raise my eyebrows. You, for example, for example, have displayed extraordinary serum resistance. Most of the divergent aren't as capable as resisting serums as you are, Matthew says. And Tobias can resist simulations, but he does the but he doesn't display some of the characteristics we've come to expect of the divergent. I can explain in more detail later. I hesitate, not sure if I want to see my genes or Tobias's genes or to compare them like it matters. But Matthew's expression seems eager, almost childlike, and I understand curiosity. I'll ask him if he's up for it, I say, but I would be willing. When? This morning, okay? He says. I can come get you in an hour or so. You can't get into the labs without me anyway. I nod. I feel excited suddenly to hear more about my genes, which feels like the same thing as reading my mother's journal. I will get pieces of her back. Chapter 18. Tobias. It's strange to see people you don't know well in the morning, with sleepy eyes and pillow creases in their cheeks, to know that Christina's cheerful in the morning and Peter wakes up with his hair perfectly flat, but Kara communicates only through a series of grunts, inching her way limb by limb toward coffee. The first thing I do is shower and change into the clothes they provided for us, which aren't much different from the clothes I am accustomed to, but all the colors are mixed together like they don't mean anything to the people here, and they probably don't. I wear a black shirt and blue jeans to try to convince myself that it feels normal, that I feel normal, that I am adapting. My father's trial is today. I haven't decided if I'm going to watch it or not. When I return, Triss is already fully dressed, perched on the edge of one of the cots like she's ready to leap to her feet at any moment, just like Evelyn. I grab a muffin from the tray of breakfast food that someone brought us and sit across from her. Good morning. You were up early. Yeah, she says, scooting her foot forward so it's wedged between mine. Zoe found me at that big sculpture thing this morning. David had something to show me. She picks up the glass screen resting on the cot beside her. It glows when she touches it, showing a document. It's my mother's file. She wrote a journal, a small one, from the look of it, but still. She shifts like she's uncomfortable. I haven't looked at it much yet. So, I say, why aren't you reading it? I don't know. She puts it down and the screen turns off automatically. I think I'm afraid of it. Abnegation children rarely know their parents in any significant way, because abnegation parents never reveal themselves the way other parents do, when their children grow to, a part grow to a particular age. They keep themselves wrapped in gray cloth armor as selfless acts, convinced that to share is to be self-indulgent. This is not just a piece of Triss's mother recovered. It's one of the first and last honest glimpses Triss will ever get of who Natalie Pryor was. I understand, then, why she holds it like it's a magical object, something that could disappear in a moment and why she wants to leave it undiscovered for a while, which is the same way I feel about my father's trial. It could tell her something she doesn't want to know. I follow her eyes around the room to where Caleb sits, chewing on a bite of cereal, morosely, like a pouting child. Are you going to show it to him? I say. She doesn't respond. Usually I don't advocate giving him anything, I say, but in this case, this doesn't really just belong to you. I know that. She says, a little tristly. Of course I'll show it to him, but I think I want to be alone with it first. I can't argue with that. Most of my life has been spent keeping information close, turning it over and over in my mind. The impulse to share anything is a new one. The impulse to hide is natural as breathing. 
She sighs, then breaks a piece off the muffin in my hand. I flick her fingers as she falls away. Hey, there are plenty more, just five feet to your right. Then you shouldn't be so worried about losing some of yours, she says, grinning. Fair enough. She pulls me toward her by the front of my shirt and kisses me. I slip my hand under her chin and hold her still as I kiss her back. Then I notice that she's stealing another pinch of muffin, and I pull away, glaring at her. Seriously, I say. I'll get you one from that table. It'll only make it'll only take me a second. She grins. So there's something I wanted to ask you. Would you be up for undergoing a little genetic test this morning? The phrase, a little genetic test, strikes me as an oxymoron. Why, I say. Asking to see my jeans feels a little like asking me to strip down. Well, this guy I met, Matthew is his name, works in one of the labs here, and he says they would be interested in looking at our genetic material for research, she says. And he asked me about you, specifically because you're sort of an anomaly? Anomaly? Apparently you display some divergent characteristics, and you don't display others, she says. I don't know, but he's just curious about it. You don't have to do it. The air around my head feels warmer and heavier. To alleviate the discomfort, I touch the back of my neck, scratching at my hairline. Sometime in the next hour or so, Marcus and Evelyn will be on the screens. Suddenly, I know that I can't watch. Even, so even though I don't really want to let a stranger examine the puzzle pieces that make up my existence, I say, sure, I'll do it. Great, she says, and she eats another pinch of my muffin. A piece of her hair falls into her eyes, and I am brushing it back before she even notices it. She covers my hand with her own, which is warm and strong, and the corners of her mouth curl into a smile. The doors open, and admitting a young man with slanted, angular eyes and black hair. I recognize him immediately as George Wu, Tori's younger brother. George was the name she called him. He smiles a giddy smile, and I feel the urge to back away and put more space between me and his impending grief. I just got back, he says, breathless. They told me my sister set out with you guys, and... Tris and I exchange a troubled look. All around us, the others are noticing George by the door and going quiet. The same kind of quiet you hear at an abnegation funeral. Even Peter, who I would expect to crave other people's pain, looks bewildered, shifting his hands from his waist into his pockets and back again. And George begins again. Why are you all looking at me like that? Kara steps forward, about to bear the bad news, but I can't imagine Kara sharing it well, so I get up, talking over her. Your sister did leave with us, I say, but we were attacked by the factionless, and she didn't make it. There's so much that phrase doesn't say. How quick it was, and the sound of her body hitting the earth, and the chaos of everyone running into the night, stumbling over the grass. I didn't go back for her. I should have, of all the people in our party. I knew Tori best, knew how tightly her hand squeezed the tattoo needle and how her laugh sounded rough, like it had been scraped with sandpaper. George touches the wall behind him for stability. What? She gave her life defending us, Tris says with surprising gentleness. Without her, none of us would have made it out. She's dead? George says weakly. He leans his entire body into the wall, and his shoulder sags. I see Amar in the hallway, a piece of toast in his hand, and a smile quickly fading from his face. He sets the toast down on a table by the door. I tried to find you earlier to tell you, Amar says. Last night, Amar said George's name so casually, I didn't think they really knew each other. Apparently, they do. George's eyes turn glassy, and Amar pulls him into an embrace with one arm. George's fingers are bent at harsh angles into Amar's shirt, the knuckles white with tension. I don't hear him cry, and maybe he doesn't. Maybe he, all he needs to do is hold on to something. I have only hazy memories of my own grief, of my mother, when I thought she was dead. Just, feel, just the feeling that I was separate from everything around me, and this consistent sensation of needing to swallow something. I don't know what it's like for other people. Eventually, Amar le leads George out of the room, and I watch them walk down the hallway side by side, talking in low voices. I barely remember that I agreed to participate in a genetic test until someone else appears at the door to the dormitory. A boy, or not really a boy, since he looks about as old as I am. He waves to Triss. Oh, that's Matthew, she says. I guess we should get going. 
She takes my hand and leads me toward the doorway. Somehow I missed her mentioning that Matthew wasn't a crusty old scientist. Or maybe she didn't mention it at all. Don't be stupid, I think. Matthew sticks out his hand. Hi, it's nice to meet you. I'm Matthew. Tobias, I say, because four sounds strange here, where people would never identify themselves by how many fears they have. You too. So let's go to the labs, I guess, he says. There, this way. The compound is thick with people this morning, all dressed in green or dark blue uniforms that pull around the ankles or stop several inches above the shoe, depending on the height of the person. The compound is full of open areas that branch off the major hallways, like chambers of a heart, each marked with a letter and a number, and the people seem to be moving between them, some carrying glass devices like the one Triss brought back this morning, some empty-handed. What's with the numbers? says Triss. Just a way of labeling each area? There used to be gates, says Matthew, meaning that each one has a door and a walkway that lead to a particular airplane going to a particular destination. When they converted the airport into the compound, they ripped out all the chairs people used to wait for their flights in and replaced them with lab equipment, mostly taken from schools in the city. This area of the compound is basically a giant laboratory. What are they working on? I thought you were just observing the experiments, I say, watching a woman rush from one side of the hallway to the other with a screen balanced on both palms like an offering. Beams of light stretch across the polished tile, slanting through the ceiling windows. Through the windows, everything looks peaceful, every blade of grass trimmed and the wild trees swaying in the distance. And it's hard to imagine that the people are destroying one another out there because of damaged genes or living under Evelyn's strict rules in the city we left. Some of them are doing that. Everything that they notice in all the remaining experiments has to be recorded and analyzed, so that requires a lot of manpower. But some of them are also working on better ways to treat the genetic damage, or developing the serums for our own use instead of the experiment's use. Dozens of projects. All you have to do is come up with an idea, gather a team together, and propose it to the council that runs the compound under David. They usually approve anything that isn't too risky. Yeah, says Triss. Wouldn't want to take any risks. She rolls her eyes a little. They have a good reason for their endeavors, Matthew says. Before the factions were introduced and the serums with them, the experiments all used to be under near constant assault with, from within. The serums help the people in the experiment to keep things under control, especially the memory serum. Well, I guess no one's working on that right now. It's in the weapons lab. Weapons lab. He says the word like they're fragile in his mouth. Sk sacred words. So the Bryu gave us the serums in the beginning? Triss says. Yes, he says. And then the erudite continued to work on them, to perfect them, including your brother. To be honest, we got some of our serum developments from them by observing them in the control room. Only they didn't do with much with the memory serum, the abnegation serum. We did a lot more with that since it's our greatest weapon. A weapon. Triss repeats. Well, it arms the cities against their own rebellions, for one thing. Erases people's memories, and there's no need to kill them. They just forget what they were fighting about. And we can also use it against rebels from the fringe, which is about an hour from here. Sometimes fringe dwellers try to raid, and the memory serum stops them without killing them. That's... I start... Still kind of awful, Matthew replies. Yes, it is, but the higher up, but the higher ups here think of it as our life support, our breathing machine. Here we are. I raise my eyebrows. He just spoke out against his own leader so casually, I almost missed it. I wonder if that's the kind of place this is, where dissent can be expressed in public, in the middle of a normal conversation, instead of in secret places, with hushed voices. He scans his card at a heavy door on our left, and we walk down another hallway, this one narrow and lit with pale fluorescent light. He stops at a door marked with Gene Therapy Room 1. Inside, a girl with light brown skin and a green jumpsuit is replacing the paper that covers the exam table. This is Juanita, the lab technician. Juanita, this is... Yes, I know who they are, she says, smiling. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Tris stiffen chafening against the reminder that our lives have been on camera, but she doesn't say anything about it. 
The girl offers me her hand. Matthew's supervisor is the only person who calls me Juanita. Except Matthew, apparently. I'm Nita. You need two tests prepared? Matthew nods. I'll get them. She opens a set of cabinets across the room and starts pulling things out. All of them are encased in plastic and paper and have white labels. The room is full of the sound of crinkling and rippling. How do you guys like it in here so far? She asks us. It's been an adjustment, I say. Yeah, I know what you mean. Nita smiles at me. I came from one of the other experiments. The one in Indianapolis. The one that failed. Oh, you don't know where Indianapolis is, do you? It's not far from here, less than an hour by plane. She pauses. That won't mean anything to you either. You know what? It's not important. She takes a syringe and needle from its plastic paper wrapping and Triss tenses. What's that for? Triss says. It's what will enable us to read your genes, Matthew says. Are you okay? Yeah, Triss says, but she's still tense. I just don't like to be injected with strange su substances. Matthew nods. I swear, it's just going to read your genes. That's all it does. Nita can vouch for it. Nita nods. Okay, Trish says. But can I do it to myself? Sure, Nita says. She prepares a syringe, filling it with whatever they intend to inject us with, and offers it to Triss. I'll give you the simplified explanation of how this works, Matthew says as Nita brushes Triss's arm with antiseptic. The smell is sour and it nips at the inside of my nose. The fluid is packed with microcomputers. They are designed to detect specific genetic markers and transmit the data to a computer. It will take them about an hour to give me as much information as I need, though it would take them much longer to read all your genetic material, obviously. Triss sticks the needle into her arm and presses the plunger. Nita beckons my arm forward and drags the orange-stained gauze over my skin. The fluid in the syringe is silver-gray, like fish scales, and as it flows into me through the needle, I imagine the microscopic technology chewing through my body, reading me and analyzing me. Beside me, Triss holds a cotton ball to her pricked skin and offers me a small smile. What are the microcomputers? Matthew nods, and I continue. What are they looking for, exactly? Well, when our predecessors at the Buryu inserted corrected genes into your ancestors, they also included a genetic tracker, which is basically something that shows us that a person has achieved genetic healing. In this case, the genetic tracker is awareness during simulation. It's something we can easily test for, which shows, if it, which shows us if your genes are healed or not. That's one of the reasons why everyone in the city has to take the aptitude test at 16. If they're aware during the test, that shows us that they might have healed genes. I add the aptitude test to a mental list of things that were once so important to me. Cast aside it was just a ruse to get these people the information or result they wanted. I can't believe that awareness during simulations, something that made me feel powerful and unique, something Janine and the erudite killed people for, is actually just a sign of genetic healing to these people like a special code word telling them I'm in their genetically healed society. Matthew continues, The only problem with the genetic tracker is that being aware during the simulations and resisting serums doesn't necessarily mean that a person is divergent. It's just a strong correlation. Sometimes people will be aware during simulations or be able to resist serums even if they still have damaged genes. He shrugs. That's why I'm interested in your genes, Tobias. I'm curious to see if you're actually divergent or if your simulation awareness just makes it look like you are. Nita, who is clearing the counter, presses her lips together like she is holding words inside her mouth. I feel suddenly uneasy. There's a chance I'm not actually divergent. All that's left is to sit and wait, Matthew says. I'm going to get breakfast. Do either of you want something to eat? Triss and I both shake our heads. I'll be back soon. Nita, keep them company, would you? Matthew leaps without waiting for Nita's response, and Triss sits on the examination table, the paper, the paper crinkling beneath her and tearing where her leg hangs over the edge. Nita puts her hand in her jumpsuit pockets and looks at us. Her eyes are dire, dark with the same sheen as a puddle of oil beneath a leaking engine. She hands me a cotton ball, and I press it to the bubble of blood inside my elbow. So you came from a city experiment? Says Triss. How long have you been there? 
Since the Indianapolis experiment was disbanded, which was about eight years ago, I could have integrated into the greater population outside the experiments, but that felt too overwhelming. Nita leans against the counter. So I volunteered to come here. I used to be a janitor. I'm moving through the ranks, I guess. She says it with a certain amount of bitterness. I suspect that here, as in Dauntless, there is a limit to her climb through the ranks, and she is reaching it earlier than she would like to, the same way I did when I chose my job in the control room. In your city, it didn't have factions? Tris says. No, it was the control group. It helped them to figure out that the factions were actually effective by comparison. It had a lot of rules, though. Curfew, wake-up times, safety regulations, no weapons allowed, stuff like that. What happened, I say. And a moment later, I wish I hadn't asked, because the corners of Nita's mouth turned down, like the memory hangs heavy from each side. Well, a few of the people inside still knew how to make weapons. They made a bomb, you know, an explosive, and set it off in the government building, she says. Lots of people died, and after that, uh, the Buryu decided our experiment was a failure. They erased the memories of the bombers and relocated the rest of us. I'm one of the only ones who wanted to come here. I'm sorry, Tris says softly. Sometimes I still forget to look for the gentler parts of her. For so long, all I saw was the strength, standing out like the wiry muscles in her arms or the black ink marking her collarbone with flight. It's all right. It's not like you guys don't know about stuff like this, says Nita, with what Janine Matthews did and all. Why haven't they shut our city down, Tris says, the same way they did to yours? They might still shut it down, says Nita, but I think the Chicago experiment in particular has been a success for so long that they'll be a little reluctant to just ditch it now. It was the first one with factions. I take the cotton ball away from my arm. There's a tiny red dot where the needle went in, but that isn't bleeding anymore. I like to think I would have chosen Dauntless, says Nita, but I don't think I would have the stomach for it. You'd be surprised what you'd have the stomach for when you have to, Tris says. I feel a pang in the middle of my chest. She's right. Desperation can make a person do surprising things. We would both know. Matthew returns right at the hour mark, and he sits at the computer for a long time after that, his eyes flicking back and forth as he reads the screen. A few times, he makes a relative, relevatory noise, a hmm or an ah. The longer he waits to tell us something, anything, the more tense my muscles become, until my shoulders feel like they are made of stone instead of flesh. Finally, he looks up and turns the screen around so we can see what's on it. This program helps us to interpret the data in an understandable way. What you see here is a simplified depiction of a particular DNA sequence in Triss's genetic material, he says. The picture on the screen is a complicated mass of lines and numbers, with certain parts selected in yellow and red. I can't make any sense of the picture beyond that. It is above my level of comprehension. The selections here suggest healed genes. We wouldn't see them if the genes were damaged. He taps certain parts of the screen. I don't understand what he's pointing at, but he doesn't seem to notice, caught up in his own explanation. These selections over here indicate that their program also found the genetic tracker, the simulation awareness. The combination of healed genes and, simul and simulation awareness genes is just what I expected to see from a divergent. Now, this is the strange part. He touches the screen again, and the screen changes, but it remains just as confusing. A web of lines, tangled threads of numbers. This is the map of Tobias's genes, Matthew says. As you can see, he has the right genetic components for simulation awareness, but he doesn't have the same healed genes that Tris does. My throat is dry, and I feel like I've been given bad news, but I still haven't entirely grasped what the bad news is. What does that mean? I ask. It means, Matthew says, that you are not divergent, your genes are still damaged, but you have a genetic anomaly that allows you to be aware during simulations, anyway. You have, in other words, the appearance of a divergent without actually being one. I process the information slowly, piece by piece. I'm not divergent. I'm not like Triss. I'm genetically damaged. The word damaged sinks inside me like it's made of lead. I guess I always knew there was something wrong with me, but I thought it was because of my father or my mother and the pain they bequeathed to me like a family heirloom, handed down from generation to generation. 
and this means that the one thing my father had, his divergence, didn't reach me. I don't look at Triss. I can't bear it. Instead, I look at Nita. Her expression is hard, almost angry. Matthew, she says. Don't you want to take this data to your lab to analyze? Well, I was planning on discussing it with our subjects here, Matthew says. I don't think that's a good idea, Triss says, sharp as a blade. Bl Matthew says something I don't really hear. I'm listening to the thump of my heart. He taps the screen again, and the picture of my DNA disappears, so that the screen is blank, just glass. He leaves, instructing us to visit his lab if we want more information, and Triss, Nita, and I stand in the room in silence. It's not a big deal, Triss says firmly, okay? You don't get to tell me it's not a big deal, I say, louder than I mean to be. Nita busies herself at the counter, making sure the containers there are lined up though they haven't moved since we first came in. Yeah, I do, Triss exclaims. You're the same person you were five minutes ago and four months ago and 18 years ago. This doesn't change anything about you. I hear something in her words that's right, but it's hard to believe her right now. So you're telling me this affects nothing, I say. The truth affects nothing? What truth, she says. These people tell you there's something wrong with your genes, and you just believe it? It was right there, I gestured to the screen. You saw it. I also see you, she says fiercely, her hand closing on around my arm, and I know who you are. I shake my head. I still can't look at her, can't look at anything in particular. I need to take a walk. I'll see you later. Tobias, wait. I walk out, and some of the pressure inside me releases as soon as I'm not in the room anymore. I walk down the cramped hallway that presses against me like an exhale and into the sunlight halls beyond it. The sky is bright blue now. I hear footsteps behind me, but they're too heavy to belong to Triss. Hey, Nita twists her foot, making it squeak against the tile. No pressure, but I'd like to talk to you about all this genetic damage stuff. If you're interested, meet me here tonight at nine. And no offense to your girl or anything, but you might not want to bring her. Why? I say. See, she's a GP, genetically pure, so she can't understand that. Well, it's hard to explain. Just trust me, okay? She's better off staying away for a little while. Okay. Okay. Nita nods. Got to go. I'll watch her run toward the gene therapy room, and then I keep walking. I don't know where I'm going exactly, just that when I walk, the frenzy of information I've learned in the past day stops moving quite so fast. Stop shouting quite so loud inside my head. End of chapter 18